Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of the Creepy Fox Podcast. Before we get started with covering today's scary stories, I just wanted to go ahead and remind you that I have been uploading some scary stories narrations, but unfortunately YouTube has been really bad with notifying you all, whether it be via your subscriptions feed or the home feed. So I remind you to go ahead and once you're done with this episode, go back and check out any of the videos you might have missed. But yeah, let's go ahead and get started with today's episode. Enjoy. This happened during spring break of this year, 2022. I decided to go to the beach to relax and to try to get my mind off of constant studying and stress. I invited my younger cousin Catherine to go with me. And when we got there, we spent the day on our boogie boards, going for rides on rented bicycles, and playing in the sand, making sand castles. I won't lie, it was a lot of fun. That was until an older age man comes up to us out of the blue, and then asks us where our parents were. I told him it was just the two of us. Bear in mind, I'm 21 years old, my cousin is 15. For me, a lot of times I get mistaken for being a lot younger. That's why I wasn't caught off guard when he asked me if we were the same age. He told me how beautiful I was, and how he had a lot of extra goodies in his van and wouldn't mind sharing them with us if we just followed him. No kidding. It was straight out of the textbook creepy, and just downright weird. We told him that we weren't interested, and then suddenly he asks us that he was looking for friends at the beach, and asked if we could be his friends. We don't tell him yes or no. We just awkwardly give him a, not right now, we're kinda busy, and then we just walk away. We turn back about a minute later, but there's no signs of him anymore. Catherine and I say that he was kinda weird, and we soon forget about him and continue on with our adventure. Now, fast forward to later that night, I had already taken Catherine back home. I was upstairs on my computer editing a video when I happened to take a look outside my bedroom window. It oversees the front yard as well as the street and homes in front of us. I saw a Volkswagen minivan, the same exact one I'd seen at the beach, parked just a few spots away from us, pull up into my driveway, and then stayed parked there for about two minutes straight. Bear in mind, this was around two in the morning, and both my parents are fast asleep. I have no other siblings or family members either, so nobody should be parking here. Nervously staring at the car, just hoping whoever was in there would leave, I watched as the driver's side door opened. I saw a hooded figure step out, and then they start to sneak their way over to the side fence, which I could no longer see since it was out of my view. Well, I listened for about 10 seconds, and then I could clearly hear the squeaky fence door opening. I had no idea what was going on, but I knew in this very moment, this wasn't right. I ended up phoning for the police, as I then walk over to my parents' room and wake up my dad. I basically gave him a quick version of what I had seen, and then he proceeds to grab the shotgun in his gun closet and tells us to wait inside the room. As we waited, I can hear my dad yelling at somebody to leave or they were going to get shot. Some more arguing was heard, until I could hear the cops. My dad yells from a window he had just opened. There's somebody in her backyard. He's back there. Long story short, the cops managed to catch up to someone, and you want to take a guess at who it was? I'll give you a second. Yeah, it was that really creepy old man from the beach. Luckily, however, no weapons on him. The thing is, how did he find my house, and how did he manage to track me down? Air tags. Yeah, those little devices that are supposed to be used to track keys or other personal belongings. Well, one of them was found nice and snug in my license plate, and he had used it to track me. Let's just say that, even all these months later, I'm still very anxious to go outside. I always check my car, and now I have an app installed on my Android phone that can notify me if there's any air tags nearby. iPhone users apparently can get an instant notification if air tags are near them, to which I say, make sure you're checking. In this case, the AirTag was used to stalk me, but they have been used by criminals as of late to tag cars and then follow the car owners. They'll wait until late at night to try and steal the car. It's been in the news as of late. As for the creep, he was jailed, thank God. However, even though he's still jailed and also ordered never to come near me again, 
even when he's released, part of me still fears he's out there watching me somehow, but I know that can't be the case. All the locks on the doors have been changed since. My dad finally was convinced to get a home security system, and I now carry pepper spray and a taser. Just a couple of weeks ago, I started self-defense training courses while still going to therapy for the trauma that he caused me. Stalking is really no joke, and I hope you can all learn from this experience of mine to always take precautions and to be aware of your surroundings. Can I just start off by saying that you're a true inspiration to me, creepy fox. I didn't have a giant cell tumor like you, but I did shatter my leg in a car accident earlier this year. I'm finally off of the painkillers, and life has started to return to normal now that I'm walking a little bit. Thank you for giving me the courage and the motivation not to give up through all your inspirational Instagram posts and Instagram stories you've posted about your journey to recovery. Anyway, enough about me. I want to go ahead and share a scary story that happened to me before I ended up breaking my leg and being in the car accident. I used to be a runner who quite often went for runs here in Southern California since I live near the shoreline. All of this training has allowed me the opportunity to train my body to compete in marathons. I've run in Orange County, Long Beach, Huntington Beach, and I even did a run in Hawaii too with one of my best friends who lives there. During the summertime, getting the chance to run was always a challenge. Not so much because of my work schedule, but because of the temperature and having the sun hit you for a long time. I have been running most of my life, so I was used to it. However, any time I could avoid said heat, I would try my best. That's why on one early morning before I would get ready to go to work, I put on my running shoes and made my way over to the beach so that I could go for a quick 4 mile run on the paved road. It was roughly 4.30 am on a weekday, so naturally there is no one. On my person was a flashlight, my cell phone, and a little thing of pepper spray just in case for emergencies, which up to that point I had never used before. Now I was able to run the first two miles with absolutely no problems. But as I'm starting to make my return back to where it originally started, I got the urge to pee. I was going to hold it in originally, but the sounds of the waves crashing and the cool breeze pressing against my skin told me otherwise. Luckily for me, there are some restrooms that were open, so I head in that way I can take care of my business. Here's when things were about to take a turn for the downright terrifying. Once I step out of the stall, and I begin to wash my hands. I catch the glimpse of movement in my peripheral vision coming from the front door. I take a quick look, and I catch the glimpse of a homeless lady standing there at the entrance, fumbling with something in her little bag. I did end up giving a nervous hello, as I now begin drying my hands. Meanwhile, something in my body was telling me to get the heck out of there quickly. Funny how the body can just sense things like that. As I make my way toward this woman, her black curly hair down to her waist, and this smell of really bad body odor surrounding me. The lady pulls out a small pocket knife and then starts telling me to hand over my phone or anything else I have worth of value. I recall chills going down my spine as she then starts to scream random curse words and then calls out to somebody named Jake. I wasn't sure who Jake was and I was hoping I might be able to sneak on by as she seemed to get distracted for a second, but then... She grabs my wrist and starts to swipe the knife in my face, telling me that she wasn't joking, but she was willing to let me live if I complied. Her words. Fight or flight kicks in, and I remember everything coming to a standstill as things now go into autopilot. If I was going to get stabbed, as it seemed that this lady was unstable, it wasn't going to be without a fight. In one quick swoop, I actually am able to pepper spray her, and I push her off of me just at the same time as her hands now go to her face, and then she responds by yelling at me saying I was dead. I pretty much booked it and I immediately start to call 911 as I hear the lady begin to scream from inside the restroom, her screams becoming muffled the farther I got away. Well, luckily she didn't follow me out. Once I thought I was at a safe distance, I waited for about 7 more minutes where luckily two police officers pulled up. 
I told them about the lady with the knife, and after another 10 minutes of a standoff, with more officers arriving, they are able to handcuff the woman and take her away. I was questioned and had to prove I acted in self-defense, and luckily after everything, my name was cleared, and I was able to return back to my normal life. The woman in question turned out to be a hardcore drug user, so that explained why she acted very strange that morning, which is pretty obvious now that I look back on it. Now, I'll be perfectly open with all of you. Having someone pull out a knife at you at the beach at like 5 in the morning with no one around to help you is very terrifying. Having the pepper spray is what I truly believe saved me, since to this day, I can't be too sure on whether or not that lady would have let me go in peace or might have killed me right there and then. I didn't have to find out, thank God, and I've lived to tell the tale. Please, to everyone listening, make sure you either take self-defense courses or you got something to protect yourself. Maybe I was a bit carried away to go running on my own, but up to that point, nothing had ever happened to me. I guess I had to learn the hard way, huh? So learn from me, and be careful, no matter where you go. This took place during summer break of 2017, when my family and I went to Mazatlan in the state of Sinaloa down in Mexico for a one-week vacation. For context, I'm female. I was 22 years old at the time, and I had just recently broken up with my then-boyfriend, who I had been dating for a little over three years up to that point. The vacation was meant to also help me get away from the toxicity that became the last few months of our relationship, and when we first got to our hotel by the ocean side, that's how things were. A great chance for me to distress, and to prove to myself there's more to life than just one guy who's trying to control who you are. By day three of the vacation, I was already comfortable and used to walking around the hotel and resort area by myself, while my two younger brothers and my mother and father stayed near the swimming pools. Of course, I made sure to let my mom and dad know I wasn't going too far, and if I was going off site, I would come to them first, so that one could join me just in case. We did actually take a little tour around the nearby city, but that was all of us together and was an entire adventure in itself, with its own little side stories I could spend hours talking about. Maybe I can send one of those in the future for the creepy fox to narrate. Anyway, I want to fast forward to later that evening, after we had arrived back from a long tourist trip. Everyone was taking turns showering after me, where once we were all done, we would be getting dinner at one of the buffets and then catching a show the hotel was famous for. As not to wait forever on my mom and dad, however, I told them I would meet them down at the restaurant and they said they would be there as soon as they were done. When I walked down to said lobby, it was jam-packed with hotel guests. Music is playing over the intercom systems. Patrons are having drinks at the nearby bar and people are dancing having a great time. I walked on over to the bar and asked for a Sprite and after hanging around for 10 or so minutes, having a quick chat with a girl around my age, I got the brilliant idea of walking on over to the beach and taking a little stroll to pass a little bit more time. And this was all by myself, mind you. Terrible idea. You have to walk to the very back end of the resort, past the restaurant we would be eating at, and then go down a small flight of stairs. When I reached the beach side, a few people I recognized from the day before were sitting at some of the hotel's beach chairs, having drinks and talking amongst themselves. After I said hello, I walked past them and then started to walk to my right, where there was a little rock formation of sorts. It's here I took out my iPod and put one of my earphones in, and since I had it on shuffle, one of the old songs I would listen to constantly with my ex popped up. Suddenly I feel all of these emotions take over, and I legit start to bawl. I notice some of you it might sound pretty lame, and you can make fun of me if you wish but I just couldn't stop the tears from falling. By the way, imagine you're walking along the beach and you see a crying woman. Chances are you're going to think it's La Llorona, a popular urban legend here in Mexico. But I digress. Suddenly, out of nowhere, I hear a voice calling out to me, and when I looked over my shoulder, a random middle-aged man approaches me and asks me if I would like to buy something. I tell him I wasn't interested, to which he now starts a light conversation and asks me if everything was alright, 
I figured he was just being nice, so I told him things were okay after wiping away my tears. And I follow up with, I was just thinking about something that happened in the past. The man then proceeds to sit down, puts his hand on my shoulder, and then gives me a huge embrace that I found a bit awkward. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. I gotta get going now. I told him as I try to move away. Uh, hello, I said I need to get going. He wasn't letting go. He decided to actually just bring me closer to him and he embraced me even tighter, and now all of these sad emotions I felt are turning into a feeling of complete dread. Seriously, I need to get going. My parents are waiting for me. No, chica. What you need right now is the lovely care of a real man. I'll make sure you're safe. I got the instant chills when he said that, as I could feel his warm breath pressing against my neck, his free hand patting and stroking my head as if I was a cat and the look in his eyes changed too. For the next few seconds consisted of me pulling his arm off of my head and then squirming out of his grasp as I try to get away. He actually grabs me in the process of me getting up, to which I then stumble and fall right next to him in the sand. You're not getting away from me that easily, child. When he called me a child, I really lost it. I remember these next moments going into slow motion as suddenly I can hear people yelling in the distance and I see this jerk suddenly perk up and then take off running in the direction he had come from. I was so confused until I look up and notice it's the three people from the hotel I said hello to roughly 15 minutes earlier. Turns out that they had left for a brief time to go get some more drinks and in that period this creep walked over to me and then started to grab me too. I'm so thankful that they were there at the right place at the right time because I don't know whether or not I would have been able to continue to overpower him. I run over to the group as they ushered me up the stairs, to which wouldn't you know I can see my parents beginning to walk toward the restaurant where I promised I would be waiting for them. I did run up to them and I began to cry heavily as a huge relief off my shoulders was finally let go. We did report the incident to the hotel staff and I asked if they could notify the police, but wouldn't you know, nothing ever came up. It's now been years since that incident occurred, and sometimes I'll have nightmares where nobody comes to my rescue, and those nightmares are what really affect me from time to time. Luckily, however, I've never had anything remotely as scary or creepy like this happen to me again, and I really hope it remains that way. Forever. This story is going to involve something that happened to my friend and I at the beach in the summer of 2005. For reference, we're both female, and we were both 15 years of age. This takes place alongside the shorelines of Corona del Mar, by the way. Anyway, that day my friend Tiffany and I were going to be taking pictures because we wanted some material for our scrapbook. That and also to enjoy being at the beach, because who doesn't like being there? Does anyone who's listening even know what a scrapbook is? I hope there's at least some of you out there listening who know. I have so many fond memories of getting together with my friend Tiffany and spending hours in her room working on our scrapbooks. Anyway, after a quick 15 minute bicycle ride over to Corona del Mar, arriving at roughly 7.30 a.m., we begin a 20 minute walk to head over to a little cove like area that eventually opens up to another part of the beach. Though we weren't going to that part necessarily, we still wanted to go to the cove to get some pictures as well as to pick up some seashells we could take home and add to our project. There were a few surfers and boogie boarders here and there, but other than them just minding their own business doing their own thing, it's just Tiffany and I. We fast forward to the cove and as waves crash against the rocks, Tiffany and I start to take pictures and think of silly poses that we could come up with. No more than two minutes later, we begin to hear the sound of someone moaning, almost as if they are in some sort of pain. We both find this odd, but put it down to our imaginations. But then about 30 seconds later, as we go inside the little cave, we stumbled into a man who was just in his underwear. He looked really out of it, and at first we thought perhaps he might be injured and needed help. Although to be fair, we saw no blood, or even cuts. 
Hey, you good? Do you need an ambulance or something? He just sits there for like 10 seconds looking at Tiffany and I before we saw him put his hands into his backpack that lied next to him. He takes out a glass pipe and tells us to join him, saying he's got some good stuff to make us feel better. Though I was only 15 years old, I had seen plenty of documentaries and police dramas with my dad, and I know full well that that glass pipe was used for drug usage. I tell Tiffany, who agrees that this guy might be under the influence of some sort of narcotic, and we agree we should go get the cops involved. I know some of you might think we're ratting him out, but in that moment of time, we were concerned more so with him getting swept away by the waves had he decided to take a wrong step. Or maybe he could have even have gotten injured. So we didn't tell him we were calling the police exactly, but we do mention we would call 911 to get him some help. And hearing this, the dude snaps. His calmer, dazed-like attitude turns into one of a maniac as he begins to threaten us and say he would kill us if we tried to call 911 or even get the cops involved. Hearing somebody say they were going to kill you is perhaps one of the scariest things you can ever experience in your life, especially coming from someone who already seems to be under the influence. We told them we would just leave and we thought that was going to be the end of it. However, here's when things take a turn for the downright terrifying. As we make the little jump down from the cave-like entrance to the sand, we can hear the man yelling for us to get back. We turned around, and wouldn't you know, we see he's now got a knife in his hand. Tiffany and I freaked out like you can't even begin to imagine, and we start to book it in the direction we had arrived from, just praying to God and neither of us would slip or fall in the sand. You try running in the sand, and you tell me if it's easy because it's certainly not. Thank God that the dude actually just gave up and just stood there and began threatening us from afar before returning back to the cave. We do manage to get the attention of a lifeguard who then phoned for the police, but by that point we had already left as we weren't told by the lifeguard to stay. I do kind of wish we would have stayed to have seen what happened, that way I could have told you about it, but we never did, we were just that freaked out. Sorry for the anticlimactic ending. I guess the hope is that nothing bad happened to him or the officers that responded and the man got the help he needed. Drugs are no joke and it's a shame how many people either OD or do something to get themselves killed. Please stay safe everyone. Your life is very important. When you're a kid, being taught stranger danger is one of the most important and valuable sets of information that your brain will ever store in your life. Sometimes, however, you might have a slip up or two, and this was one of my lacks of judgment that saw myself and my cousin encountering one of the most frightening life experiences of our lives. I don't really think I've heard anybody ever have this happen to them, but let me know if you have. For context, this was back in 2008, when I was on spring break visiting family in the state of Michoacan, in Mexico. If that name sounds familiar, it should. Michoacan, a beautiful state in Mexico with its fauna and flora, has been overrun by violence in the recent years, mainly by the cartel. It is quite sad to be honest, but at the time I was visiting, that was unheard of. Anyway. I should mention that I'm male and I was 15 years old when this occurred. Now, it all started when my cousin, Carlos, aged 17, and myself ended up going to the beach so that we could ride on our ATVs as well as go fishing. The stretch of beach we drove on went on for miles. It took about an hour and a half just to arrive at the little peninsula at the end. That's where we were aiming to go. The only reason we were going that far was because another family member had been out there years ago and they claimed that there was a lot of big fish out there as well as ones you rarely see. Anyway, before we even started anything, we stopped at a little store so that we could pick up some bait as well as some snacks for the drive. I recall the man at the cash register warning us about driving too far as they had recently dealt with a couple of ATV riders who got stuck out in the middle of nowhere. The reason they were found was because somebody in a boat had been fishing by the coastline 
and they managed to see them. Anyway, we thanked them for the knowledge as we exit the little shop and we prepare for the long trek ahead. Before we knew it, the once busy and lively beach, with families and kids playing in the water, was silenced by the sounds of our engines as we were on our ATVs heading east alongside the coast, with our sun-kissed skin being met with the warm, silky summer's air. Along the way, we saw plenty of birds flying above, with plenty of patches of coconut trees being littered every few miles. After about an hour and a half, we noticed what looked to be like a series of abandoned huts. Seeing as both of us are very curious, we let go of the gas and soon hit the brakes, as our ATVs eventually come to a stop. You guessed it, we wanted to check out these abandoned huts. Because, you know, curiosity. They were fairly uneventful, apart from the vulgar graffiti and trash everywhere. We had to be careful as there was a bunch of broken bottles and even a couple of used needles. Come to think of it, we were pretty dumb to even attempt walking in those small structures. So, while we were reading some of the graffiti, we ended up being interrupted by the sound of a car engine approaching. This spooked both of us as we used the cover of the structure to take a look outside. Moments later, a truck with five men step out with guns. And we're not talking about little pistols. Oh no, I'm talking full-on assault rifles. You should have seen the look of absolute fear on her faces as we hear one of them make a remark about our ATVs. From what we were able to gather, this must have been some sort of spot for these criminals to meet up. As if things couldn't get any worse, they then begin searching the immediate area. We use the cover of a cheap couch to hide, but unfortunately, we ended up being found. I'm surprised the man didn't just kill us there, but he told us to stand up and put our hands up, and then slowly walk out of the hut. We were met moments later with the sudden stare of eyes from these intimidating men. The entire time, their assault rifles didn't leave our small and non-threatening teenage frames. One of them then asks us what we were doing here, to which we nervously respond with just taking a break. They then talk amongst themselves before returning their attention back to us, saying no ordinary teenagers have any business being here. They go on to explain this was a location where they did their so-called business trading, and nobody was allowed to be loitering around unless they had some sort of connection with their group, or permission. We apologized non-stop, thinking that at any moment that was going to be it, and we were going to be shot dead, but that didn't happen. They lowered their rifles, as both Carlos and I jumped back onto our ATVs, and we leave. That wasn't without one final warning, however. They actually ended up firing a couple of rounds into the air, which I think was their way of saying, you got off lucky, and never return. Unfortunately, or should I say fortunately, we didn't go to that fishing spot we were told of, and instead we drove back home, never to return to that beach again. As an update, all of these years later, it's advised people stay away from that area. It's very dangerous, not that you have to convince me otherwise. I've always listened to scary stories on YouTube, for the last two years or so, and I've always wanted to share my own experience. Sorry in advance for the length. This happened in 2007. For some context, I was a 16-year-old boy at the time. I always enjoyed camping, and given that I've lived my whole life up until that point in Southern California, it makes sense that we camped at the beach, a lot. The way beach camping works is there's a beach, obviously and then about a hundred foot cliff at the top, and that's where the campgrounds were, packed with hundreds of families, friendly, outgoing, and sweet. The beach is about a one mile stretch, with several 100 feet high staircases leading up to the campground. On the southernmost end, there was construction at the time, so that part of the campground was closed, while the beach was still open. We were on the northernmost part of the ground, about a 12 minute walk to the southern part, also, I had a three-year-old lab named Nibby, who was the sweetest, most loyal dog I'd ever met, as well as the bravest. She would do anything for our family. I also forgot to mention that the southern part ends in a channel, with a bridge from the main road going over it. My whole family, mom, dad, little brother, had taken our dog that same morning to the south end to play in the water. So now, 
let me begin the story. My friends were camping about 60 yards south of us. I had been hanging out with them for most of the day, and I was just relaxing with my family at my site at about 7.45, when Nibby started whining, her way of saying she wanted some attention. I decided I would just walk with her for a bit. It was getting pretty dark, but I wasn't worried at all. I was completely safe in the campground, and I wasn't planning on leaving it either. So I decided I would walk her all the way to the south end, staying in the campground. I made sure to grab my phone, and we began walking. To no surprise, there are still loads of kids biking and skating around the ground, drunk dads yelling while playing cornhole, the usual. The only thing is Nibby was not used to this much commotion, and just as we're almost at the very end of the campground, she started freaking out. Looking for a quick way to calm her down, I look to see the last staircase on the campground, and I make my way there. As we're going down, I quickly notice three things. One, the tide has come up all the way so that there's almost no beach. Two, it just got really dark. And three, we are the only ones down there. I do plan to take her the last 50 yards south down to where the channel is, up to the bridge, and onto the main road, and then we'll walk for the remaining way back along the road. One thing I forgot to also mention about this beach is that the southernmost part with the channel was not visible from where I was standing. The way the cliff was configured, I would have to walk all the way there just to see what was going on. Another thing, the tide was so high, the whitewash was hitting very hard against the rock on the corner where we would need to walk past. Alas, we continue walking when Nibby begins to tweak out again. This was unusual for such a calm environment, and very quickly, I see why. There are two men peeking around a little nook formed in the cliff, so I very quickly nope out of there, attempting to sprint. Only problem was Nibby, who I'd never seen angry before, wanted to square up. Not literally, and she was not moving. With the hair on the back of her neck standing higher than ever, she was barking her head off at these two lunatics. Now, you might be thinking, how come nobody came to help you? The answer to that question is that it was now it was pretty dark, and most people were getting ready for bed. On top of that, the nearest people were a hundred feet above us, and Nibby's barks were unheard due to the crashing of the waves. Anyway, I decided to let go of the leash and dip, not wanting to stick around to see what those guys were up to. Much to my surprise, Nibby came running up right beside me, and saying that that was the fastest I'd ever ran would be an understatement of the century. That is the fastest anybody in my entire family had ever run. I got to the top of the stairs in about 25 seconds. I pick up Nibby's leash and turn back. This is where I expect to see them charging up after me. But the thing is, I don't. All I see is the light of a flashlight coming from about 25 yards away from the base of the stairs, which eventually turns back the way they had been before. I ran to not the nearest bathroom, but the next closest one, and this is where I call my mom. I tell her Nibby had hurt her paw and asked if she could pick us up. She got there in about two minutes, and she asked if we had been down at the beach. I choked trying to answer, and I broke down, and I told her everything. She notified the park ranger on the campground, and we gave a statement of sorts. This whole situation probably would have just become a forgotten memory, if not for the fact that just four days later, we had been home for two days. It was confirmed that two children had gone missing while at that same campground. My mom and I quickly got a hold of the police, and we reminded them of what I had experienced just a few nights before. While we never did officially find out what happened to those kids, I am about 99% sure it had something to do with those guys I saw that evening. This whole thing kinda was messed up. I won't go back to beaches by myself anymore, and I'll never go to a beach at night again, no matter how many people I'm with. I never feel safe by myself at night, and I'm constantly looking in cracks and caves for people who might not have the best intentions. As for Nibby, she passed away just a year ago, almost to the day. She was the greatest dog I ever had, and I can't help but think that she saved my life that night. 
I have no doubt about it in my mind. I would not be alive had it not been for Nibby. Thank you, Big Nib. I love you. I've lived in Southern California all of my life, and one of the biggest reasons why I've chosen not to move is the weather. It's gorgeous, and during the spring I love to go hiking with my two German shepherds. While I've never had anything happen while I went hiking or backpacking, I did have something creepy take place when I went camping with some friends a few years back. We were camping along the beach in a private area and we had spent most of the day in the water surfing and scuba diving. When we weren't in the ocean, we were relaxing underneath our umbrellas, usually reading, listening to music, or eating food. Toward the evening is when things started to get a little bit more interesting. Another family had shown up, a mom, a dad, and two little kids, but they had stationed themselves quite a distance from where we were currently set up. The nice part was they invited us over to shoot off some of the fireworks they had brought with them. This was about a week before 4th of July, and thus we got an early preview, so to speak. At about midnight, we finally went into our large tent. There were three of us, and one by one we started to drift off to sleep. I forgot exactly what time it was, but it couldn't have been more than a couple of hours. I was able to hear feet shuffling in the sand. I had my eyes closed when I heard the noise, and at first I thought it might be one of my friends. However, because the footsteps seemed to be circling our tent, I started to question why one of my friends would be up this late and doing that too. I opened my eyes and I immediately got a chill. Both of my friends lay silently asleep, so if it wasn't them, who was outside? In a state of panic and fear, I reached into my backpack and I grabbed the survival knife I'd packed and I grasped onto it ever so tightly. The footsteps continued to circle our tent until they stop in front of the zipper. It opens from both the inside and the outside in case you're wondering. To my absolute horror, I watch as the zipper slowly starts to open. I reach to my friends and finally shout at the top of my lungs hoping to scare whoever was trying to get in. My friends, bless their hearts, are startled awake and we all bear witness to a man holding a knife having this expression that said, Jackpot. However, it quickly changed when I pointed the survival knife back at him. Um, sorry, I thought this tent was empty, he said in a nervous wreck, and then he runs off, heading in the opposite direction of where ourselves and the family were camping. We immediately went to wake up the family, and they told us they had no clue of anyone being out there, and that they weren't together. In the end, we packed up our things, and we left shortly after, heading to my friend's house instead. We aren't sure if the family stuck around as well, but I'm pretty sure they left too. To this day, we're very certain that had I not brought the survival knife with me, and had I not woken up, things might have turned out completely different.